500 years of resistance is what we say. Utilize this period as a time to demystify Columbus. The 500th anniversary is genocide, racism, bigotry, hatred. We have something to contribute to uh, this country. We don't want your pity. We want your support because we need your help because we cannot continue another 500 years of these genocidal policies. Christopher Columbus is the one who contributed to the extinction equation. The extinction of culture is going as fast as the extinction of plants and animals. Catherine Smith lives in the heart of Big Mountain. Everything that is important to her is here. Her family, her sheep, her religion, and over four generations of family history. At first glance, it looks peaceful, but thousands of lives, including Catherine's, were severely disrupted in 1974 when Congress awarded this land to a neighboring tribe. She and others have resisted government orders to move for over 15 years, orders that call for the largest forced relocation of a people since the Japanese were relocated during World War II. To outsiders, the land is remote, undeveloped, and possibly full of rich coal deposits. To Catherine, the land is her life and her religion. She believes that two of their holy people live here, including one who helped in the very creation of mankind. Her prayer bundle represents a kind of Bible and has been handed down through her family along with prayers to help protect Big Mountain. The origin of the problem dates back to the first government attempt to distinguish Hopi land from Navajo land in 1882. A government agent demanded and got Hopi boundary lines created to further his own personal and political goals. The problem with his perfect rectangle carved in the middle of Navajo country 
was that it included Big Mountain and thousands of Navajo people who had been sharing land with the Hopis for centuries. The inaccurate boundary lines bothered no one until the 1950s when an energy resource boom hit the area. Land ownership questions were raised by a collusion of powerful individuals, all with direct ties to the energy companies. In response to these questions, the courts declared the area a joint use area, basically acknowledging the historical land sharing patterns between the two tribes. In 1962, a clearly defined Hopi reservation was also created, covering the area where most of the Hopis actually lived. The energy boom continued into the 60s and 70s as a large coal strip mine moved in just north of Big Mountain, and heavy coal, gas, and uranium development began to encircle the area. Overzealous attorneys and an effective public relations media campaign helped to promote dissension between the two tribes and the continuing land questions were referred to Congress. In 1974, the joint use area was finally divided into separate ownership. The traditional Hopis and Navajos are united in protesting this law, saying it is a violation of religion for an estimated 6,000 Navajos and 100 Hopis to be forced to relocate. Only one thing seems clear. If relocation can be completed, it is unlikely that the Hopis would move into the area to live, and the energy boom would be free to continue. Some 900,000 acres of land would be clear for possible energy development. The government has relocated Navajos before, pushing them off valuable land and resources in the long walk of 1863. Some managed to remain hidden in the remoteness of Big Mountain. Others escaped and still others were allowed to return after their near extermination. One of Catherine's grandmothers was born on that long walk of 1863. She recalls hearing stories of how they survived on wild food such as the red cactus berries. Catherine is clear and sure about where she belongs. Ask her where Navajos come from, for example, and she responds easily. They come from inside of the Six Second Mountain. From under the earth, they said. Catherine lives closely with the cedar and pine that help her with food, fuel, and medicine. She knows that pinyon nuts can be heated and wrapped to cure stomach pain, and the tree's gum can help arthritis. She knows cedar berries can be boiled to cure diarrhea, and says sage and yucca are just a few of the plants on Big Mountain that are used for ceremonies. And this is a, a medicine, too. When I used, when I was a little girl, I used to chew the root and make a gum, too. One of Catherine's favorite places to visit is where she was raised, up a long stretch of road where her sister now lives, cut off by choice from most of the modern world. One summer, I stayed there. Oh. In my kids here like that place. <laughs> now they are growing up. They, they sure like to, to check that place. Catherine's mother ran a busy trading post out of their home here in the early 1900s. It was a lively place filled with horses and wagons and friendly trade between the Hopis and Navajos. I used to play around here with the, the rocks and there was a, a, a spring down there and they used to play in the water. I sure got happy to be uh, stay here all the time. Catherine speaks fluent Navajo, and because she is one of the few elders who also speaks English, she has met many reporters covering the more confrontational aspects of this story. She always asks where they were born, and is surprised that they have all moved so far from their birthplace. And they moved to the New York, to the Fran Fran Francisco City, and to the north side, they move all around. We're not like that. 
We just sleep on this, in the six sacred mountain all the time, all, 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 all of our life. When you are in the present, you're inside of your mother. You got your mother breath, and it's the same with the big mountain that way. It's my breath. I born in around the big mountain, so that's my mother too. So all of my life, I just always be thinking of this place. My spirit gonna be here forever. Catherine's children and grandchildren visit often but only two of Catherine's children live permanently at Big Mountain. The others, like Des Bajun, have been forced to move away for schools and jobs. We consider any, any job site as an artificial setting. Uh, when we do come back over here, you know, we sense that um, permanence, and it gives us a sense of rejuvenation, a uh, new hope, a new horizon. And sometimes we have uh, a blessing with ceremonies, ceremonies with my mother, or she might, you know, light a pipe. And so there's a, a real sense of um, uh, rejuvenating life itself, you know, in many ways. This is our place, our uh, place of birth. We're um, bound to this land here. First man and first woman were created from two ears of corn in the Navajo creation story. And Catherine uses the corn's pollen for prayers and other ceremonies. See, everything that uh, we see and everything that my mother sees around her is uh, an animate um, object. And uh, she can't hardly relate to the to earth or anything else around her as an inanimate object. So everything around here is, is alive to her. And so in that way, uh, she sees this, uh, this earth as, you know, as a part of her, it's alive. In a uh, philosophical sense, you know, they, they say there's nothing absolute. And to her, everything is absolute. When I was young, maybe about the age of uh, six or seven, I remember where we used to have about 10 times as many sheep. The plan is, you know, for each a person to maybe have one, uh, maybe at the most five heads of sheep. They feel that, you know, that's enough for uh, an individual family to have to live on. And when they do uh, take the sheep away, um, what happens to uh, the people um, to have subsisted on? using the livestock that's part of their subsistent living. You know, that'll be wiped out and uh, people will be wiped out. I think, you know, that's probably as simple as that. The family has struggled for over 15 years to maintain a balance, which they say is difficult due to the constant airplane surveillance, livestock impoundment, and relocation inspections to see that no home or health improvements have been made. There's no running water here and no electricity, but this is home, and Catherine and others will not leave voluntarily. There's been a lot of devastations and a lot of heartache, and uh, in a sense, a lot of confusion. And what once was is just been, you know, it's just like a dream, and when you think about it, you know, you, you wake up one day and you find that, you know, you might be just driven off the land, you know, any day, you know, it's, it's so unreal, you know, it's, it's frightening. Catherine's son, Roy, had a dream of raising his own family at Big Mountain, but had to find work outside. He said the constant tension over the land helped create marital and alcohol problems and made his dream impossible. Once you start thinking about it, You'll have a problem, and you'll, you're trying to turn into, turn to something to comfort you. Turn to alcohol, or you know, anything will happen to you. 
and um, it's hard life here. I wish there wasn't a land dispute, none whatsoever. And maybe things would have been different for me. Roy says that since people can't see statues or cathedrals, they think there's nothing here. He says prayer sites cover this land and have been in use long before the first white church was built in America. A lot of us have our own root, deep root, that is built into this land here. It's just, just like um, the Statue of Liberty. As a nation or as a, a country, we build something. That's the same way with us Indian here. We build something and we plant it. Right here comes relocation. And rather than taking a shovel and smoothly taking it deep with the root and everything else, you just grab the plant and rip it out of there without any cautions. And this is what it's doing to the people's life today. Julian Begay, Catherine's other son, is a Vietnam veteran who fought for his country and now says he is without one. We went through tragedy and overseas in Vietnam for 16 months. The sorrow was I came back to concentration camp as soon as I got back. And I'm still in, in the concentration camp. The world be completely closed in and I just don't have anything. I'm a homeless soldier. There was a ceremonial hogan where Julian was helped to recover from the traumas of the war. It was torn down when the barbed wire fence was built within a few feet of the front door, rendering it useless. Catherine fired a gun to stop the fence builders here, and that partition remains open. The fence was built to show the new boundary lines between the two tribes, lines that Julian and other traditional Navajos and Hopis refuse to accept, fearing it will ultimately harm both tribes. All my relatives that uh, confronted this fence just crossed the wash here. And there has been uh, violence took place with the federal police. People that are resisting are still resisting. Julian, too, says he thought alcohol was the answer to his pain, but says it wasn't. It just added to the trauma. He lives with Catherine and dreams of one day being able to build his own home. I don't feel like a proud soldier anymore. I'm a, a prisoner instead of a, a veteran. Marie is married and lives in Canada but says the threat of their mom's removal is felt by the whole family, no matter how far away they may live. All I can see in my mind is, I see the land and I see the people, I see uh, the homes that are there, you know, a lot of things that are familiar, you know, the livestock, landmarks. When you think about relocation, I just think of things dying. Our religion evolves around the land. Our prayers are in, with, tied with the earth here. In, the, in a sense, the government is pointing the, the gun at their heads and saying, well, you move. You know, you're, so you're saying that your prayers aren't important. Move from this land. And so if they go to another place, there, there is, yes, the earth there, but it's not the same thing. Because Big Mountain here is, is, is um, it's a sacred mountain. And there is a, a Navajo shrine up there. And um, once you separate them, they'll die. The government operates a relocation commission that has lured hundreds of people off Big Mountain at a cost estimate of at least $340 million. Catherine's daughter Nancy got a $100,000 home. Both she and her husband found good jobs, and the promises did sound good to her and her four children. The convenience is here, but the, uh, the quietness that I had at Big Mountain is not here. 
I don't know I don't know the area here. I don't know the land. I don't know the what kind of a ground I'm sitting on. If there's any place I want to live and you know, have a home was a big mountain. Nancy is the keeper of the family's prayer bundle that she received from Catherine. She helps translate for many of the relocated Navajos who are showing alarming patterns of an increased death rate, alcoholism, and mental health problems. Nancy says their stories deeply trouble her, especially one told by her own grandmother, Lydia Watchman. And she had this one particular tree that she used to pray to, you know, she uh, tried to tell this to the uh, people that were receding, that were using bulldozers, you know, to cut down all the trees. And this one day, they went and buried her, her uh, sacred spring. And uh, they, went, they went over this tree that she treasured so much. She cried for mercy. Every time I start talking about relocation, Every time I start translating for anybody or having to talk on relocation issues, I just get choked up with tears. And uh, I try to be strong, but you know, every time I talk about uh, the relocation issue, what, you know, what's going on at that big mountain, you know, it's really hard. Nancy says Navajos are taught not to show their emotions, so not many are aware of their intense suffering. Nancy's grandmother died shortly after her prayer site was destroyed. The law is, is really, you know, tearing us apart, tearing us away from our land. You just wonder, you know, what kind of a game is it? It seems like, you know, they're just trying to do away with the holy people, making them suffer day and night, and, you know, to see how, how many of them would, you know, soon pass on. The death of our, one of our uh, favorite uncle, Daniel Ashkey, truly uh, stemmed from uh, the heartaches and the hardship that he experienced from the land dispute. As we've always known, and a lot of people have known him, you know, to to be out there grazing, he said he was always in a sense with um, being seen uh, in a traditional manner. And uh, when this came about, uh, him and uh, many of my uh, older uncles and aunts have experienced a lot of uh, physical ailments. And uh, I know my mother, a lot of times, has gone through a lot of depression. When I feel, you know, when things get rough, when, when I get to a point where I can't really hold my stress, I go back. I go back and take a drive up the big mountain. And uh, just the atmosphere there, you know, makes me feel good. I was told, you know, wherever you, you were born, where, wherever your little court was cut, you know, always remember that and, you know, put a smoke there and pray for yourself. I do that every now and then. I know just the spot where I first hit the earth. In spirit, you know, in, in my mind and, you know, down deep in my heart, from, I am from Big Mountain. And I'll probably die thinking that way. 
It is Navajo women who inherit land, so forced relocation violates a woman's self-esteem. It's a deep loss, a kind of cultural rape. The relocation. Public Law 5393531 has ruined, ruined me. I've noticed that. Uh, I'm losing uh, my memory. I have a hard time concentrating. I can't sleep at night. Sometimes, uh, like this one night, you know, I, I just woke up. I've never had that feeling. I just woke up and, you know, I was really depressed. I just started crying. And uh, I walked up and down in my, you know, around here in the bedroom, in the kitchen. I finally went and told my husband, but I don't know. I I don't think he really knows just, you know, what I am going through. And that night, I just had that feeling that, you know, nothing's going to help. Nothing is helping and nothing's going to help me, you know. Nancy, born and raised in one of the most traditional of Navajo households, tried to accommodate the law. One Friday in January, she kissed her husband goodbye as they went to work. He told her not to cook. They were going out to dinner. A dinner that never happened. She died unexpectedly that day in 1987 of a massive brain hemorrhage, some say brought on by a massive heartache. Every day I just feel like, you know, I'm waiting for a ride or something, waiting for some good news that would help the people up the big mountain. The prayer bundle of Catherine's had been passed down to Nancy. Now the sacred bundle will be passed to June, and the prayers for Big Mountain will continue. <laughs>